What's up, guys? I'd like to thank Ethan Campbell and Chris Gerecki. I know I'm saying that wrong, but thank you for your recent donations. That was a pleasant surprise. You must have been watching some old videos because I haven't even posted it on any of the videos in like two years, but thank you. Uh, I'll try to find the link and put it down there if anyone else would like to make a one-time donation or become a Patreon. So I've talked about the 14th century catastrophes setting the world back probably 500 years, technology-wise. Now, two great examples of this is Cologne Cathedral and the Santa Maria del Four. Both of these were started in the early 1300s, and these guys knew what they were doing, and they knew that they had the manpower to finish these when they began, but then the catastrophes hit, and they couldn't do it, and these things set empty for hundreds of years. So here's the deal. The catastrophes, the droughts, floods, earthquakes, everything didn't just hit and then all of a sudden everything got better. This was the start of the little ice age that off and on lasted, you know, basically into the early 1800s when we started having huge population growth. But it was tough times off and on for a few hundred years there. And I'm talking about storms that literally took out coastlines uh, very electrically charged storms. This is why all the old buildings had to have lightning rods on them. And I'll get into a lot of instances of these actual storms that changed islands and, you know, coastlines and everything. But I want to put this into a historical context. So we're all taught about the medieval peasants and all this. And the thing is, is we're not taught anything about just prior to that. I would say the world was basically technologically wise at what we had for the 1700s. But here's the reality of history is what we're looking at with these castles and these small walled off communities with farmland all around are bug out shelters. Now, I don't know how much of the history we're given prior to the 14th century catastrophes is even close to correct. But what I do know is we have the archeological ruins of this society all over Europe, the Mediterranean, and you find all kinds of Roman baths, or at least that's what they call them. But it was obviously a civilized society that kept itself clean as to where after the 14th century catastrophes, the Native Americans commented on how dirty and disgusting the Europeans were. But either there were two catastrophic events around 500 AD and the 14th century, or it was one and they just added in a bunch of time between the fall of the Romans and what continued after into the little ice age. But you had all different classes of people in the ancient society. You had, you know, the aristocrats and the masons and carpenters and the workers and all these different classes of people. But by the 14th and 15th century, they History just kind of tells us that these people were just dumb peasants. When it's not like that. It, just like today, we're the people that makes the city go round. We're the butchers and the carpenters and the tradesmen that built all of those, you know, three-story houses that you're seeing in the background here. We're the people that planted the fields. We're the people that ran the cattle. We're the people that did everything that was needed for a society. But we're taught history through Darth Vader's perspective to where they want you to believe that without the almighty emperor, none of this could have possibly happened. And it's just not the case. We are the people that have done all of these things throughout history. And, you know, just like always, the boss gets the credit. But so the elites back in the day, just like today, could recognize a sinking ship when they saw it and they built themselves bug out shelters. These are built with one thing in mind, and that is defense. And it's going to take a lot of people to keep this city running. And it's going to keep, you know, take a lot of people to protect the crops from the invaders because the food supply chain broke down. Then on top of that, you had a period of nonstop rain from, I think, 1314 to 1317. It ruined crops for five years. No harvest. They call it the Great Famine. And this was before the Black Death even hit. And you can see in the background there, the dark clouds 
And you see that people were still using the buildings of the ancient city there. I wish I knew exactly where this was at. But anyway, I just wanted to clear that up about the medieval peasant myth. It was people just like today going through a catastrophe just like one could happen right now. And, you know, we are seeing the shifts happening already. Now, if you don't know, there are ocean currents all around the world that are basically keeping the temperature in balance. And I was just reading a study about, you know, they were examining the seashells that could have only grown you know, in warmer temperatures in certain areas. And they calculated there was a shift in these right back to the 14th century. So this all gets thrown out of whack. It throws the jet stream out of whack. And it seems like it comes on quickly, but it didn't go away very quickly. We've been lucky the last couple hundred years and grew up in a very stable time period. But that was about like the medieval warm period, a couple hundred years where society grew really large and then just got hammered. Now, what you're looking at here is called the Zuder Z uh, in the Netherlands, and it's no longer there like that. But a storm of what they're saying is 1287 carved out the Zuder Z. The great drowning disaster of 1362 eroded 15 kilometers or seven miles inland of the Danish coast destroying over 60 parishes or counties. Think about how many people live within seven whole miles of the coast. Four 14th century storms along the Dutch and German coast had estimated mortalities of 100 to 300,000 each. North Sea storms in 1099, 1421, and 1446 took out 100,000 in England and the Netherlands each. And it says by far the worst storm was All Saints Day flood of 1570 when 400,000 people were eliminated throughout Western Europe. Now, I, I got to find a new name for my research. If you guys have any ideas, put it down in the comments. But chaos cycle or something. But, you know, here's your mud floods. And I can do this for, you know, pretty much every period, you know, every area of the world. But... That name has come to mean mud falling from the sky or something that I, I disagree with more than I agree with now. I don't think there was some worldwide event that only hit the cities for some reason. There were periods of time where we had unimaginable storms. This woodcut we're looking at is the absolute destruction of some city during the All Saints Day flood. Then towards the end of the Maunder Minimum, uh, 16... 34, 71, 1682, 86, there was another series of storms with similar casualties, and it says that most of the coastline of northern Europe owes its origin to this period of storms. For instance, storms reduced the size of the island of Heligoland from 60 kilometers to one kilometer. So this little bitty island you're looking at right here used to be 60 kilometers, 30 miles across. Now let's go back and look at the old maps. When I started, I was trying to fit into the cool crowd and look for one singular event that changed the cartography of the world. One massive tsunami that changed islands and coastlines and all of this. But after a lot of research and looking at all of the evidence, that's not what the evidence suggests. Now, there were earthquakes and tsunamis, but there's also big, huge storms that happened. And the worst of it seemed to have happened, you know, over a series of events in the 14th century. But periodically, these came back for the next three, four centuries up until the 1800s. And when you're digging through the libraries of the old maps, you see this all of the time, a new exact map of a certain area. This happened from 1500 to 1800. They were constantly having to update but now I've got written accounts that confirm what I'm seeing on the maps, that coastlines were changing, islands were changing. Before I really get into it, I do want to point out that this is a Mercator projection that everybody is used to. This is the world standard on maps. This is the Gauls Peters projection, which is a lot closer to reality from what I've heard. And it's interesting that their little blue ball pictures from, quote, space don't show the world closer to the Gauls-Peter map. It shows a Mercator projection, which I'm sure most people 
know that they have confirmed that the blue marble is a composite photo of many smaller photographs. And then there's the azimuthal equ equidistant map. Now, the reason I'm bringing these up is all of these relative to themselves are actually correct. If you're looking for 50 degrees north latitude on the prime meridian, that's right here on this projection. If you're looking for the same 50 degrees north zero prime meridian, it's right here on this projection. So they give you the right coordinates no matter which layout you're using. The reason I'm telling you that is if you are trying to do an overlay like this, you have to take into account that you're gonna have different projections used by different map makers. So the larger the scale you're using, the more distortion you're gonna have between the two types of maps. But you can zoom in close and use coastlines and tell the differences here. So the first big one I notice is to the west of Normandy right here. Notice the small little peninsula that is there right now, but you go back to 1577, and where the little white dot is, is the modern day coastline. You can see that that peninsula used to jut out to the west 50, 100 miles. I'd really have to scale it out to know for sure, but that's a huge difference. And if you rewound 10 seconds and played that through a few times, you would see that the north coast of Europe actually lines up all the way up to Denmark pretty well. But you get a lot of distortion between these two projections when you're looking at England and Ireland. So let's just look at these side by side and compare, you know, the relativity of themselves to for the differences. The white dot on the right is current day Wales, but look at the map on the left. You can see that that peninsula extends almost over connecting to Ireland and it is nowhere close to Ireland in modern times. Also, the west coast of Ireland used to have three distinctive peninsulas jutting out towards the west. And nowadays it looks completely different. There's kind of two little outcroppings there. This is the west side facing the Atlantic Ocean. So this is the side that takes all of the storm surge. Also looking at the northwest of Scotland, you can see that there used to be a peninsula at the northwest corner up there jutting up towards the north that is no longer there. And there were four distinct islands out here. Now, one thing that I don't believe is that these cartographers were stupid because when the scale is the same, the coastlines line up perfectly. And you mean to tell me that they didn't know the difference between four islands being there and not being there? No, I have written accounts saying that there were storms powerful enough to change islands and coastlines and that the cartographers were looking at a totally different landscape in 1577 than they were today or even a couple hundred years after that. Go up further into the North Atlantic and it gets even stranger. I laid this out kind of weird because these lines right here both represent the Arctic Circle. And on the map, on the left, the old map, you can see that the Arctic Circle basically bisects the island that is there. And they actually had this named as the island Thile. And I'm wondering if this is part of the Thule legend. And the bottom left shows the old isle, island of Friesland that is no longer there. In the old map, they're also depicting an inlet going very far up into the island of Greenland there that doesn't appear to be there anymore. Most people have probably heard the story that when the Vikings first started settling Greenland, they named it Greenland just to get people to come over there. We all know that it's mostly covered in ice, and a big thing to the GW story is that the Greenland ice sh shelf is melting. But is that really the case? Because they're drawing trees all over Greenland here. And, you know, I've seen some of these maps where they depict, you know, ice shelves and glaciers. It's well documented that growing seasons were thrown out of whack by the beginning of the Little Ice Age and that you couldn't grow crops in the northern latitudes of Europe anymore. So in my mind, it's quite possible that the ocean currents shifted and Greenland went from an actual green land to the ice-covered barren wasteland that we have today. And of course, you know, Quackadamia would say that I'm an absolute lunatic because the ice shelf has been there for hundreds of millions of years. But once again, guys, 
at the fundamental level of our quote education indoctrination system they've taught us lies they've taught us uniformitarianism where all of these geological processes take hundreds of millions of years and you couldn't possibly comprehend it because it's such a long time frame and a volcanic island takes hundreds of millions of years to form but here's a volcanic island that just pretty much formed overnight and this isn't a singular event in fact it happens all of the time literally all of the time there are constantly new islands being formed and you know of course there were freezing periods and all of this you know the frost fairs and i'm not going to really get into that i'm going to end with kind of the strangest thing that i found here and the only thing reason it's strange is because i don't know where the sand came from but they say it's not just the flooding that was a problem there were many sandstorms that caused great destruction such as the great colbin sandstorm of 1694 which blew so much sand over the colbin estate in scotland that the farm buildings themselves disappeared the estate became a desert and was never reclaimed so this is back to the changing landscape of scotland and again this wasn't a singular event a similar event took place at forvey also in scotland in 1433 when the town disappeared under 30 meter high sand dune 90 feet tall sand dune. Lamb also refers to the storms between 1570 and 1668, which blew millions of tons of sand miles inland across the Brecklands of Norfolk and Suffolk, burying valuable farmland. The area has never been recovered and is now Heathland. Lamb believes the wind strengths of these events are probably unparalleled in the 20th century. So, you guys, when these shifts take place, we have storms that are literally unimaginable to us living in the time frame that we have lived in. And like I've said many times before, ocean travel was difficult due to rough seas and unpredictable storms, lightning storms. And the people that lived during those centuries had a whole different set of problems than we have today. You know, they didn't have the luxury of the abundance of food and a bunch of time on their hands and the Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos of the day the the rich powerful people went out and purpose built these defensive castles so that they could bring a few people with them to work the land and survive themselves and this is where our modern history really starts with the survivors of the 14th century catastrophes moving forward into the little ice age and historians have decided to paint all of the people that made it as these worthless medieval peasants that without their overlords would have never got anything accomplished when the reality is these were the butchers and the carpenters and the tailors and the shoemakers and when the food supply shortages began the rich people took the probably the most useful of the population with them so that they could start their own communities but you're also going to need a good portion of just straight up thugs to fend off the invaders which have basically just became the police force of the elites over time so i hope this video has put history into a little better perspective for you i'll catch you on the next one peace out